today, one in two people in the generation born today will have cancer in their lifetime. In 1930, it was one in 30 people. In 1970s, wow. when my dad worked for Nixon, it was one in 10. And that's when President Nixon declared war on cancer and he, with federal funding, and many presidents would do the same since then. And it's gotten us better treatment, better diagnosis, more treatments cater to the exact type of cancer. But it's not stopped the rate of people being diagnosed with cancer. It continues to go up to where it's one in two for the generation born today. And the last prediction I heard from a doctor a few weeks ago on a summit was that they're now predicting that by the year 2030, it'll be one in one, meaning that all of us will have cancer. Everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Adapt You podcast. Super pumped to have on today's show an incredible guest by the name of Ginny Dent Brandt. So Ginny is a very interesting guest. She actually grew up with a uh, father who was a senator who worked and served under three presidents for almost 30 years. She lived in that sort of high political life, um, had a little red phone in her house that would uh, ring in the wee hours of the night because if the president needs something, like literally like the bat phone would ring and you know their, their, their life was dictated by that. So she definitely grew up in sort of an unconventional sort of lifestyle living in that environment that I think most people have the opportunity to experience. And uh, in 2015, Jenny was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she found out because she's actually a very healthy person, uh, her ring actually got caught up in her nightgown and it forced her hand across her breast to be able to feel a lump. And um, with, uh, with, with that said, she began her journey, an unconventional journey to uh, not only figure out what caused her cancer, but in her road to healing from her cancer, what steps could she take uh, to be able to have a, a better experience because the cancer she was diagnosed with was incredibly aggressive. She was not given on her first opinion, a very good um, prognosis, but she's not the type of person growing up in a household with very motivated individuals to just sort of sit back and let things happen. She, she took the bull by the horns and went through incredible research um, and really sort of um, changed the way in which she approached her cancer recovery. And she's written a book. Uh, and this book is incredible because it goes over eight things that you can do to really prevent yourself from not only getting cancer, um, but if you do have cancer, what things can you do today uh, with that cancer diagnosis to uh, help ensure that you not only recover from cancer, but you actually don't have it come back. Because a lot of people don't realize it's the things that we're doing over time throughout our life, the little things from the things we put on our skin, what we eat, what we drink, the air we breathe, how much sleep we get, these things that she's going to go over that seem fundamental and simple and basic uh, at, at one level, but they are the way in which we are supposed to treat this body that takes us through this journey called life. And Ginny's going to break it down. I am absolutely psyched because people need to hear this. You need to listen to what she's saying because um, not many do. Uh, we've gotten in this, this, this world of convenience. We've gotten in this world of laziness where we're not doing the basics of what these bodies that evolved over hundreds of millions of years are intended to do. We're not intended to have uh, be sitting on a couch eating terrible food covered in glyphosates, watching Netflix and not moving, right? We're intended to throw spears at tigers in the Serengeti. That's what our body is intended to do. But, you know, we've gotten to the point where we don't have to do that anymore. Um, but some of the basics we can get back to, Ginny's going to talk about as she learned uh, through her recovery uh, of, uh, of, of a very aggressive breast cancer. So that said, let's get on to the show with Jenny. All right, everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Adapt You Podcast. Extremely excited to have Jenny Dent Brandt on the show. Jenny, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Derek. It's great to be here. We've got a fellow Southerner, as you're going to hear in her accent. Uh, we, are, we, are we are neighbors, being a North Carolina boy. She is uh, our, in the neighboring state of South Carolina, and we were, we were chatting a little bit before the show, and she said that uh, 
it's somewhat of a miracle that we're talking uh, for a variety of reasons, for, which we're going to get into. But one of which is, uh, Jenny, you were you were a really uh, shy shy gal growing up. Didn't really uh, want to be in uh, on the microphone or have a camera in your face. Correct. That is true. I was born an introvert. I also uh, stuttered and stammered and struggled to learn to read and write. And now I'm in the opposite realm. So it's it's amazing how your life experiences, which we're going to get into, is sort of led you to uh, you know stepping into the light because you know your story and your experience and all that you you have to offer in terms of helping other people through their journey. Uh, it's good to see that you've overcome that. Uh, and is it something that comes more naturally to you now with the, having the headset on and chatting, or is it still a struggle? No, it's not a struggle anymore. And it came gradually from my teenage years through my college years through a modeling career that got me up in front of people. And I had I started doing TV commercials and speaking on TV, but it's not something I would have directly, you know, chosen. And in time, it now it doesn't bother me at all. It's it's very natural, but it was not the way I started out. And anyone that knows me growing up is shocked that I'm now the speaker and the author and the one who gets in front of thousands of people to speak because they knew me as a child and knew me as someone very different. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that uh, that you've kind of gone through that process and that we have an opportunity to speak today because what you're talking about today, I think, is incredibly important and impacts so many people that go through, they have change thrown upon them when they run into something or are diagnosed with something as, as terrible as cancer. And it's, it's, you know, your experience and what you've learned through your process, which is incredible, which I want to dive into next. Um, it can really help serve a lot of people. So with that said, I know in the intro, I talked about it, but, but it, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself um, you know, your, your, your upbringing and all that. And then kind of, you know, tell me about that, that moment when you, when you discovered of your diagnosis. Okay. Well, Derek, I grew up in the halls of power of Washington, DC, because my father served a Senator and three presidents. So we got to do some pretty neat things and it was a wonderful life, of course, until Watergate hit. But when Watergate hit in the end, my father was one one, two. There were two men out of 65 who did not receive prison sentences, and thankfully, he was one of those. But wow. from that experience of Watergate, where my mother was depressed before Watergate began and hospitalized with it, and then my father went through the trials, I learned how to get through difficult times. And when I got that cancer diagnosis, the first thing I did was what I did. When Watergate and my mother's depression came upon us, I prayed and I asked God to direct me and to guide me. And that was the first instinct when the doctor called and said, you have cancer. Of course, I was shocked. I called my husband. He was shocked. And as soon as I got home, he laid hands on me, prayed for me, and we asked God to be with us and to guide us and to open the right doors and to provide healing. And looking back, it's clear he definitely did. But yes, I went through that, um, the, what I call that roller coaster ride of fear and shock and worry, only to discover that all those things helped to drive the cancer. And so I realized I had to get off that roller coaster of fear and worry and shock, and I couldn't stay there. And I had to be proactive. Now, keep in mind, I'm diagnosed four months after my mother has just died from this beast. And my sister and I were her caregivers. So I was still grieving her loss. When my ring got tangled in my nighty after doing the Cooper River Bridge run, okay, that morning, that night, in the middle of my sleep, my ring gets caught in my nighty. And that's when I providentially found the lump. Oh, wow. So your, your ring got caught in your nighty like this and, yeah. and then you, your hand happened to graze over and yourself I said, to feel what, what is, is that? that? 
What is that? Oh, you wow. know, I, I advocate today that women need to check themselves monthly. And, you know, men need to occasionally because men are getting breast cancer today, not at the same rates as women, but it happens to men. And I wasn't doing that, of course. Had I been doing that, I would have caught it sooner. But it was the shock of all shocks. But I look back, it was the providence of God, because if that had not happened with the aggressive nature of my cancer, I might not be here today. Because the next week, when the doctor told me, yes, it's cancer, then the next week, more test results came back in. He said, it's not just cancer, it's aggressive. Nobody wants to hear that. No. And then the next week, the MRI results came back. And they told me it appears to be in your lymph nodes, it's planted other tumors, and it looks like it's in other parts of your body. That means stage four aggressive cancer, that is not survivable. And they said, you know, we're going to pull out every weapon we can to save your life, but we can really own. All right, Jenny, let's, let's try this again. Take two. Here we go. All right. All right, everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Adapt You Podcast. Extremely excited to have Ginny Dent Brandt on the show. Ginny, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Derek. It's great to be here. We've got a fellow Southerner, as you're going to hear in her accent. Uh, we, are, we, are we are neighbors, being a North Carolina boy. She is uh, our, in the neighboring state of South Carolina, and we were, we were chatting a little bit before the show, and she said that... Uh, it's somewhat of a miracle that we're talking uh, for a variety of reasons, for, which we're going to get into. But one of which is, uh, Jenny, you were you were a really uh, shy shy gal growing up. Didn't really uh, want to be in uh, on the microphone or have a camera in your face. Correct. That is true. I was born an introvert. I also uh, stuttered and stammered and struggled to learn to read and write. And now I'm in the opposite realm. So. It's, it's amazing how your life experiences, which we're going to get into is sort of led you to, uh, you know, stepping into the light because, you know, your story and your experience and all that you, you have to offer in terms of helping other people through their journey. Uh, it's good to see that you've overcome that. Uh, and is it something that comes more naturally to you now with the, having the headset on and chatting, or is it still a struggle? No, it's not a struggle anymore. And it came gradually from my teenage years through my college years through a modeling career that got me up in front of people. And I had I started doing TV commercials and speaking on TV, but it's not something I would have directly, you know, chosen. And in time, it now it doesn't bother me at all. It's it's very natural, but it was not the way I started out. And anyone that knows me growing up is shocked that I'm now the speaker and the author and the one who gets in front of thousands of people to speak because they knew me as a child and knew me as someone very different. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that uh, that you've kind of gone through that process and that we have an opportunity to speak today because what you're talking about today, I think is incredibly important and impacts so many people that go through, they have change thrown upon them when they run into something or are diagnosed with something is as terrible as cancer. And it's, it's, you know, your experience and what you've learned through your process, which is incredible, which I want to dive into next. Um, it can really help serve a lot of people. So with that said, I know in the intro, I talked about it, but, but it, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself um, you know, your, your, your upbringing and all that. And then kind of, you know, tell me about that, that moment when you, when you discovered of your diagnosis. Okay. Well, Derek, I grew up in the halls of power of Washington, DC, because my father served a Senator and three presidents. So we got to do some pretty neat things and it was a wonderful life, of course, until Watergate hit. But when Watergate hit in the end, my father was one one, two. There were two men out of 65 who did not receive prison sentences, and thankfully, he was one of those. But wow. from that experience of Watergate, where my mother was depressed before Watergate began and hospitalized with it, and then my father went through the trials, I learned how to get through difficult times. And when I got that cancer diagnosis, the first thing I did was what I did. When Watergate and my mother's depression came upon us, I prayed and I asked God to direct me and to guide me. And that was the first instinct when the doctor called and said, you have 
cancer. Of course, I was shocked. I called my husband. He was shocked. And as soon as I got home, he laid hands on me, prayed for me, and we asked God to be with us and to guide us and to open the right doors and to provide healing. And looking back, it's clear he definitely did. But yes, I went through that, um, the, what I call that roller coaster ride of fear and shock and worry, only to discover that all those things help to drive the cancer. And so I realized I had to get off that roller coaster of fear and worry and shock, and I couldn't stay there, and I had to be proactive. Now, keep in mind, I'm diagnosed four months after my mother has just died from this beast, and my sister and I were her caregivers. So I was still grieving her loss when my ring got tangled in my nightie after doing the Cooper River Bridge run, okay, that morning, that night, in the middle of my sleep, my ring gets caught in my nightie, and that's when I providentially found the lump. Oh, wow. So your, your ring got caught in your nightie like this, and, yeah. and then you, your hand happened to graze over and yourself I said, to feel what, what is, is that? that? What is that? Oh, you wow. know, I, I advocate today that women need to check themselves monthly. And, you know, men need to occasionally because men are getting breast cancer today, not at the same rates as women, but it happens to men. And I wasn't doing that, of course. Had I been doing that, I would have caught it sooner. But it was the shock of all shocks. But I look back, it was the providence of God, because if that had not happened with the aggressive nature of my cancer, I might not be here today. Because the next week, when the doctor told me, yes, it's cancer, then the next week, more test results came back in. He said, it's not just cancer, it's aggressive. Nobody wants to hear that. No. And then the next week, the MRI results came back. And they told me it appears to be in your lymph nodes, it's planted other tumors, and it looks like it's in other parts of your body. That means stage four aggressive cancer, that is not survivable. And they said, you know, we're gonna pull out every weapon we can to save your life, but we can really only extend it and probably a, extend it for a few years. And so that's about the worst news anyone can receive. But that drove me not only to research, but to get on a plane, fly to Chicago and get a second opinion. And I advocate that anyone with a serious health condition, whether it's heart disease or Alzheimer's or whatever it is, get that second opinion at a specialty center that, you know, is just top notch at what you've been diagnosed with. It makes a difference because that cancer center in Chicago called CTCA or Cancer Treatment Centers of America, said, we don't know that it's all over your body. It has planted other tumors. It is aggressive. Your life's in danger. You will need all these weapons brought out to save your life, but we don't know that it's in your lymph nodes and we do not know that it's spread all over your body. What we're seeing is inflammation that was spread a debris over your body from the biopsy, which is a rarity. And so, you know, inflammation and cancer to some eyes can look the same on a scan. And so that was the best news I heard after three bad news is in a row. I was like, finally, maybe it's not all over my body. Maybe I'm not going to die. You know, what year, what year was this? Like when, when were you diagnosed? It was 2015 when I was first diagnosed. Okay. So about five, you know, six, six, seven years ago. And okay. Now I can't hear you. You can't hear me. That's odd. Now I can. Okay. I can all hear right. you now. Okay. So now you can. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Melissa, just, just edit this part out. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to ask the same question again that, okay. we, that I just asked. All right. So how long ago was it? Uh, or what year was it that you were actually diagnosed with, with breast cancer? I was diagnosed in May of 2015. So it's been six and a half years. So let's go back a little bit to that moment. Um, because uh, thankfully, uh, I haven't had that type of a moment in my life. I hope I never do 
where you're sitting in front of a, a of a doctor and you, you felt a lump, you did the test, they walk in that moment, like, take me back. What's it feel like? How do you feel? Um, paint that picture for us so we can understand what that moment is like. Cause I have to imagine it, it sucks. <laughs> It, it really does. It's the shock of all shocks. And the doctor, who's an oncologist who wrote parts of the book with me, he comments throughout the book. He said, when you receive a cancer diagnosis, all of these stress hormones go off in your body. And, you know, you have to deal with that. So the first thing my husband did after, you know, he laid hands on me and prayed for me and hugged me was we went on a walk to relieve the stress I had, you know, the stress of that diagnosis and managing stress is a key part of getting through any uh, cancer or other disease diagnosis because stress can drive any disease. Stress can help to cause any mm -hmm. disease. So managing stress and my emotions is going to be a key part of getting through this cancer journey successfully. But it's the news no one wants to hear. And let me say this, Derek, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I don't want someone to have to be sitting across from a doctor and get that news. I don't want someone to have to sit in that chair as I did for a whole year, every three weeks, and have the nurse roll the toxic chemicals in that they're going to infuse into your body that has hazmat written all over it. That is not a good feeling. And I sat there and I thought, what could I have done differently so that I wouldn't be in this chair? And what I'm trying to help people to do is I can get them through the cancer journey and their prognosis be better. There's no doubt about it. I can help them prevent the cancer from coming back, make their chances better. But I don't want people to get cancer to begin with, because mm -hmm. all these doors are opening to me that I do not want open. My body is precious to me and keeping it healthy and strong and pain-free is important to me. And all these things they were gonna bring out could drastically alter my life for the rest of my life and leave me in chronic pain and weakness. And I was determined to fight against that. And so the eight steps that I implemented through research through doing thousands of hours of research, helped me to actually end the cancer journey with my doctors calling me their rock star cancer patient. And I was pain free and I was not weak. You're looking at a gal who was snow skiing during the middle of chemotherapy. I did that Cooper River Bridge run the next year during chemotherapy. I climbed mountains with my sons and my husband on hikes during chemotherapy, these things are unheard of. But science now validates that the best thing a cancer patient can do is to exercise and move daily. Now, doesn't mean you're going to run a marathon, okay? You don't want to go too far. But the point is, the more you move, the better off your body is going to work in getting those chemicals out, getting them where they need to be, enabling them to work and cleaning your body out afterwards because you don't want those toxic chemicals hanging around in your body for year after year after year. And it's exercise and sweat that gets those chemicals out. So I didn't know while in the cancer journey how beneficial exercise would be, but I made a commitment to walk two miles after each surgery. I did, and it prevented all kinds of mishaps to walk two miles before every chemotherapy, two miles after every chemotherapy. No doctor told me to do it. Now doctors are starting to tell their cancer patients to do it because it prevents cancer to begin with. And it helps the chemotherapy to target the cancer and then to remove the toxic chemicals afterwards. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it seems so, so basic, right? I mean, exercise, walk. Um, but in today's, uh, arena or in today's society where it's all about convenience, it's all about, uh, not having to leave my house, not leaving, having to leave my couch. I, everything's at the, you know, at the, at the hands of this little, this little box right here, That's right. Uh, it, you know, we are for the first time in generations, our life expectancy expectancy as a society is actually going down. 
right? That's so right. Continue to climb over years is going down. Why is that? Um, and it's sedentary yeah. lifestyle is one of the reasons. I'm personally convinced that it's it's definitely one of the reasons. Our bodies were oh, yeah. made to move and to move every day. And we have to find ways to move because our conveniences and our inventions like cars and all these things make it so that we can be the couch potato. And that's the worst thing you could do during a cancer journey and during a COVID pandemic. Agre yes, we could talk. So that, and, yes. Yeah, that, that same dedication I had to walking, um, you know, that four miles a day that I did two before chemo, two afterwards and two to four every day in between, my husband and I did have done throughout this pandemic because mm -hmm. you need to pump that lymphatic system. It is your garbage disposal system and it helps pump out viruses and all these things. You, you, you've got to move. If you want your immune system to work as it was designed by God, you need to move daily. But exercise is just one of the steps in my book and the research clearly backs it's one of the best things a cancer patient can do. Now, let me clarify this, though, Derek. If your doctor operated on your knee because your cancer was in your knee and he told you not to walk for five days, you're going to listen to your doctor because that's a weight bearing part of your body. And he's trying to reduce swelling until it heals to a certain point, And then he's going to tell you to move. So your doctor overrides everything I say in the book. When they tell you something, it's for a specific reason. Yeah. And, and it's exercise as uh, you know, we talk about pandemics, we talk about cancer. We just talk about the prevention of it, which I know we're going to get into in, in a bit. It's, I mean, it is the fountain of youth. It is, you know, we live again in this society where, uh, you know, cancer is, is one of these things that I think has been born from this sedentary type of a lifestyle, right? The stresses, all the, the EMF that's flowing through the air, all these things out there that our human bodies that evolved over hundreds of millions of years were meant to be, you know, chasing our food in the Serengeti with spears, Right. But in the last couple hundred years, we have all these conveniences. Our bodies have not adapted to that, uh, nor will they, because this stuff is dangerous. So uh, it's it's good to hear one of the steps you talk about is getting back to the basics of exercise. Let's talk about those other steps. You know, let's, I mean, I don't want to beat around the bush uh, in, 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 in doing that. Share your story as well, if you don't mind, of your journey as you sort of implemented and learned about these different steps and how you discovered them. Because I know you did extensive research and you really, you just said, I'm all in on this. And uh, you, you took the bull by the horns. You didn't, you know, you, you ran at it, which is, which is great. I really did run at it with everything I had, and that was for several reasons. Number one, I wasn't afraid of death. I was afraid of being disabled. That was my biggest fear. And the next fear was that I didn't want to leave my husband a widower. And I really work a lot with young moms who have cancer that have several young young children because I have such a heart for them. I didn't have to worry about my young children and whether they would have a mother to raise them or not. My children are grown and self-sufficient. So that worry was not on my shoulders, but I didn't want to leave my husband behind a widower. We had things we wanted to do. And so that also drove me into this research on this quest to discover, number one, what caused my cancer? Because there were eight risk factors for the cancer I got. I didn't have a one of them. Number two, I wanted to find out what I could do to help my doctors to beat my cancer and to lessen the side effects of this horrific chemotherapy that I was going to be given, which I later found out was the worst regimen known, chemo regimen known to mankind. Not everyone survives this chemo regimen, and it does leave behind a debris of all kinds of issues and inflammation and neuropathy and, of course, hair loss. You know, hair loss was a small thing. I wasn't worried about that. But I wanted to find out what I could do to lessen that, yet help my doctors to beat my cancer. But if I can't figure out what caused it, like I said, I had none of the risk factors. They did extensive genetic testing because my mother died of breast cancer. I didn't have any genetic factors either. So, Derek, I had nothing 
to mm-hmm. hang my hat on and say, this caused my cancer. And the doctors do like for you to know if there's something you're doing that helped to cause it, like if you're smoking or if you're a woman who's taking birth control bills, pills, that ups your risk for estrogen fed cancer. So if they know you're doing something, they like to tell you they couldn't put their finger on anything. And I'm going, well, I'm not stopping there because if I can't figure out what caused it, once you kill it, how am I going to prevent it from coming back? back? And so I was like Dorothy, you know, my book is an analogy to the Wizard of Oz. I'm, I'm like on a journey like Dorothy, and I'm trying to figure out how to get back home to a normal life, what she would call Kansas, you know, and the book is all about pulling back the curtain on cancer. Because, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, Toto pulled back the curtain mm-hmm. on, on the wizard. And as I'm learning all these things, it's like the blinders on my eyes of what causes cancer are slowly being removed. Not everything. I still don't know everything, but I know a lot more. And I think what motivated me to write this book and to speak about it on television and radio podcasts nationwide is simply this. I don't want someone to be in that position. Today, one in two people in the generation born today will have cancer in their lifetime. In 1930, it was one in 30 people. In 1970s, when my dad worked for Nixon, it was one in 10. And that's when President Nixon declared war on cancer and he, with federal funding, and many presidents would do the same since then. And it's gotten us better treatment, better diagnosis, more treatments cater to the exact type of cancer. But it's not stopped the rate of people being diagnosed with cancer. It continues to go up to where it's one in two for the generation born today. And the last prediction I heard from a doctor a few weeks ago on a summit was that they're now predicting that by the year 2030, It'll be one in one, meaning that all of us will have cancer, one or more cancers in our lifetime. So this is why I'm on a mission, because what I learned was there were everyday things I was doing that were helping to cause my cancer. And they're everyday things that almost everybody's doing. And when I realized that, I said, you know, I've got to, okay, we're putting all these, um, potions and chemicals on our skin, these personal care products that we use have phylates, they have parabens, they have ingredients that are outruled, you know, they're not allowed in Europe. Because whatever you put on your skin, you ready for this? 60 to 70% goes directly into the bloodstream without being filtered by the liver. Hmm. And this, this was the shock of all shocks as I kept uncovering things and asking for tests to be done. And this one wasn't because I was so smart. It was because after the chemo was over, one of my doctors suggested that to get the chemotherapy out of my body, I join a sauna club or, and sweat, you know, or buy an infrared sauna. So I bought a sauna because I was going to use it three times a week. And then the sauna company asked me to be in a clinical trial study to see how effective their sauna was. So they started me out with, oh, we're gonna do a chemical test on you to see what chemicals are in your body. I didn't know such a test could be done. I do the test. When I see the results, it's not just the chemotherapy. I knew that was in there, right? It's 15 other chemicals that had built up in my body over time, including Agent Orange pesticide. This gal did not serve in Vietnam, including glyphosate, you know, that's what's sprayed on our crops today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, there were 15 total toxic chemicals that had built up in my body and bingo, most of them were endocrine disrupting chemicals that mimicked estrogen and estrogen is what was driving my cancer. But it wasn't necessarily coming just from the inside of my body. It was coming from the outside in. When I realized that happened to me, how many people is that happening to? And they don't even know it. Now, I'll be honest with you. I tested my husband. He didn't have the high levels. We live in the same house, eat the same foods. We're two pigs eating out of the same pig pen and the same trough, you know, and his were in the yellow and green zone. And I had 15 in the red. Okay. So what does it tell you? 
We have five filtering systems given to us by God, the liver, the colon, the kidneys, you know, all these systems in your skin is your largest detox organ and his are working better than mine. So I'm not here to say that everyone has the toxic load that I had, but in talking and interviewing doctors that do these tests regularly on their, on their patients, integrative doctors, they'll tell you that 60 to 80% have one or two toxic chemicals at high levels in their in their body so you sit there and you go okay we've got a toxin problem and how are these toxins getting into our system through our skin through what we eat through the water we drink through the air Air. and some of these things we have no control over but i say derek now control what you can control Mm -hmm. i filter my water we have a water filtering system in this house now and you know, we eat organic as much as possible. We're not freaky about it. You know, some things aren't going to be organic and some things don't need to be organic because the USDA has tested the pesticide residue of all the fruits and vegetables and produce and some are higher than others and Mm -hmm. some have a skin to protect them and they don't get into what you eat. So those things, you know, we're not going to squabble about or, or worry about, but the things that do matter, we eat organic. And, you know, we've just had to, you talk about adapt, your program is called adapt. I mean, we had to change, radically change our lifestyle. And I was known as a health nut. I ate better than the average American. Derek, I learned that's, that's not too good because just better than the average American is better than bad. You know what I'm saying? The standard American diet and the sedentary lifestyle I discovered were both contributing factors to my cancer. And I may have done more exercise than the average person, and I may have eaten better than the average person, but for my body, it was not good enough. So I had to go from the three, four, five plants, fruits and vegetables I was eating a day. I'm now up to 10 to 15 in any given day. Does it make a difference? Yes. Every plant God created in the kingdom promotes healing in your body through the antioxidants, fiber, and phytochemicals. And, you know, when God created the world, he told Adam and Eve, this is what I've given to you for food. Only in this day and age can scientists tell you every antioxidant, every phytochemical, every type of fiber located in each, and they all complement our DNA and every single plant in God's kingdom fights cancer and disease. But what are we getting the least of in America? Plants. Yes, yeah. you're a hundred percent right. It's it's hard, and I'm sure you discovered this when you started to go on your journey and you started to realize food. Because I went through a similar journey as it relates to food and a gut issue, um, which which was profound. The impact that had on my body. Then I thought I was eating healthy as well. But I was eating, like you said, I was eating better than most Americans, but it still (laughs) sucked, right? Uh, Right. Until you realize what actually true organic, healthy, um, you know, strong plant-based diet is. And then you, (laughs) then you, 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 you leave your home, right? Where you actually have to go eat somewhere uh, or travel and you realize their options are like nil. Like if you're going out to eat, it's very hard to find a place and you realize this is what people are eating and, and, and you see the marketing around it and all the emphasis around it on the convenience of it. And you, it, it, it makes, it's actually very difficult unless you truly know, like, you know, how to eat that way. So it's great that you're teaching, you're teaching people because you're right. I was in the same boat. I was like, I was an Ironman triathlete, right? So I extreme, I exercise to an extreme and but my gut was tore to shreds because I was eating a lot of dairy and I was eating a lot of, uh, carbohydrates like, you know, flour based, gluten based, corn based carbohydrates and grains, not enough vegetables. And it was all process and all this stuff. You know, I thought I was eating Turkey meat and that was good. You know, Turkey lunch meat that's just filled with a bunch of garbage. So it's, it, it is, it is crazy. Um, and, and I, I love hearing you talk about this because It's so, so important what we put in our body. Um, And I know that was a big part of your journey is, is realizing the toxins and what you put on your body. Yeah. What you put on your body, but you're talking about the gut now and you had a problem Mm -hmm. with the gut. Most Americans have a compromised 
gut. And when you go through chemotherapy, your gut is totally destroyed because of the chemical, just like antibiotics destroy mm -hmm. your, your gut. These chemotherapy chemicals destroy your gut in order to kill the cancer. So what you have to realize is you got to protect your gut during chemotherapy. And then at the end, I completely rebuilt my gut so that my immune system was back and functioning, according to my doctors, within six weeks instead of two to five years. So these are all the things you do to prevent the cancer from coming back so that, you know, a lot of people are weakened after the, after the chemotherapy. And that weakness can go on until they die. I mean, sometimes it never goes away. You never get your white blood cells back or your red blood cells where they were or your platelets. Mine were back in six weeks. It was clearly what I was doing. And so that's why I'm, I'm just, you know, on a mission to try to help other people get through the journey, but prevent cancer to begin with. And then those people that have had cancer, none of us wants it coming back. You know, mm -hmm. so this is what I do now. It's not something I would have chosen. <laughs> I wouldn't didn't want the gift of helping people like this to go through a journey like this. But I say you've had, you got to bloom where planted, you know, and I went through the worst chemotherapy, had one of the most dangerous cancers and to survive that and come back healthy is a blessing. And so I intend to bless other people and try to prevent it from happening in other people which is fantastic. So let, let's dive more into it because I know there's more here to unbox. So you've talked about what you put on your body, right? You talked about the water you drink and purifying it. You talk about the air, right? And we don't realize how these small particles that are floating around in the air, how it, they can impact your body at a, at a cellular level. Um, and then uh, you also, and obviously we talk about food, what are, and exercise, right? So basics you know breathe good air drink good water right <laughs> well let know, me say uh, drink enough water let me clarify that one because the water content is important for your toxic load but you must have enough water the first step in my book is proper hydration and people don't understand what that means you not believe how many parents i've talked to and people i've talked to they say well i drink eight cokes a day Coke <laughs> water dehydrates yeah. You know, and adds all this chemical load and acidity to your body. You need pure, pure water that counts as hydration and you need half your body weight in fluid ounces daily. So if you weigh 150 pounds, that's 75 ounces at a minimum. If you sweat, you got to add more water. If you feel a cold coming on, you got to add more water. If you're in mm -hmm. higher altitudes, you've got to add more water. If you get in the sauna like I do twice a week now, you have to add even more water. So every cell, every system, every organ in your body has to have sufficient water in order to work properly. And that includes your immune system. I mean, if you're dehydrated, it's not going to work well. And then again, when you go through chemotherapy, OK, you need increased hydration to make sure the chemicals get to every cell and that they move out of your system. And it's the hydration and the exercise together that allows that to happen. If your digestive system just totally shuts down, which is what chemo can 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 do to you then all those chemicals are going to recirculate in your body and it can put you at risk for sepsis. This is what a, a problem a lot of people get into in chemotherapy. So it's important that you hydrate properly, increase hydration, and then move as much as you possibly can. So those two work together. So water and movement, uh, and it makes total sense. And again, these are things that, you know, from the perspective of, okay, I have cancer. This is things I need to implement. They're also if I don't have cancer, proper hydration and proper uh, movement, I would imagine these things you're going to continue to discuss really play on both sides of the, I have cancer, I don't have cancer fence, right? I mean, it's, it's absolutely. They prevent cancer to begin with. They get you through the journey and the toxic treatments mm -hmm. and they prevent the cancer from coming back, which is all three paramount. So and it's, it, let me tell you, it's paramount. But the interesting thing is 
My father died from Alzheimer's disease. I was one of his care, caregivers. And that was a nine year journey I would never want to go through again. And that's when I began researching. And the same things you do to prevent Alzheimer's from all the doctors I've consulted with are the same things you do to prevent cancer and autoimmune disorders. I mean, everything in the book comes down to these eight steps in my book because all eight steps allow your immune system to work as God intended. And so all disease is about the immune system. I don't care if it's COVID-19, it's been proven and I've heard many doctors lecture on this. The fact that um, if you're exposed to COVID and your immune system is working very strongly, okay? And if you put some mitigation in place, social distancing, you know, a mask as somewhat of a barrier, and you are careful about what you do, you might not get COVID to begin with because you have a nasal mucus cavity that is designed to prevent viruses from settling in. You have a gut mucosal barrier that is also there. And so your body is meant to protect you from these things. Now, the problem is COVID is very contagious. So it's very easy to catch. But if you're following the eight steps in my book and moving and hydrating and eating healthy food, you know, if you're doing the eight things in the book, you're not as likely to get these severe symptoms to you it might be more like a cold or a mild flu. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Derek, both my husband and I at the end of February went to the Virgin Islands. We got COVID. We were very cautious. We got it, did not know we had it because our main symptom was we lost our appetite mm -hmm. and I started feeling fatigue. And the next week I felt the fatigue more, but we were also climbing mountains walking two to three miles on the beach every day and swimming a mile in the ocean. So that can make you fatigued. So we didn't recognize that we had COVID, got back, found out we had it. Again, strong immune system, exposure to COVID, um, you're not as likely to get bad symptoms. And all during that first year of the pandemic, we were exposed over and over and over again because of ministries in our church and things we were doing and promoting this book. And we kept getting the call. The person you were with last night has come down with COVID. You're going to have to be checked. We have kept having to get checked. And so we were thinking, you know, we're not going to catch this, but we did. Now we have what you call natural immunity, and, which is mm -hmm. the best vaccine you can get. Are we still cautious? Yes. But again, you live a healthy lifestyle, your immune system's working as God intended, you're going to fare better. I love every word that you just said, because throughout this entire pandemic, there has been very little focus on the basics of taking care of your body and it will take care of you. And there's very little focus on health. And I hate to say it, but the number one risk factor for COVID is obesity. The other one is hypertensive. Amen is hypertensiveness, right? So, you know, those two sort of go hand in hand. And if you take care of yourself, like you do, you're walking, you're swimming, you're, you're eating healthy and all that stuff. You take care of your body, it'll take care of you. It's a very simple concept, yet one that is such a far reach for so many people as it relates to COVID, general health, all pathogens and cancer. So I love the, your message because it, it is so, it is basic. And it's in it, but it, but it is it is for so many people, it's a slap in the face because they're not doing it. Um, they're right. not making and it they don't want to change. You know, I've run into cancer patients that have called me for help because someone's pressuring them to oh, call her and see what kind of help you can get. And they go, You mean I have to change my diet? I can't have my hamburgers, cokes, and french fries all day long and my donuts. And and I'm going, Nope. You mean I have to get up off this sofa and go exercise? I don't exercise and I don't like to exercise. I said, you got to, you got to move. You got to exercise. I can't help people like that, that aren't willing to change. And I will tell you this, Derek, I see more willingness to change in your generation than I do my generation. Because the longer you've developed these unhealthy lifestyle habits, eating the sad diet, being sedentary, the longer you've done that, the harder it is to change. But I will give you some hope here. I'm helping two 75-year-old men who have stage four cancers. They are handling the chemotherapy. They are doing well. 
because they have totally changed their lifestyle. So there are people even older than me who cut the gluten, cut the dairy, cut the harsh meats that are hard to digest and did all these things so that they could allow their body to heal during chemotherapy rather than putting more load on their body by, you know, the standard American diet. And they're, they're faring better as a result, you know? So there are people willing my age and older, but I see more willingness in your generation than I do mine. And I'm seeing more people in your generation willing to change up front and go, you know, grandma Sue and granddad Bob and, you know, he died of this, she died of this. And I saw how horrible that was. And I don't want to go there. You know, I see more of that willingness to look at that, examine it and say, you know, what, what can I do differently? And being willing to change in the younger generation than the older generation. Yeah, I totally get those. The, the habits are really ingrained and set in with the older generation and, and unless they're a why, right? Unless they're their, their, their purpose or their reason for, for making that change is strong enough. They're, they're not going to, I've seen it as well with so many people that, you know, even we had a, I have a friend of mine who, who they got COVID for the second time. They had a very, very bad experience with it, but they smoke, they drink, they eat like crap. You know, they, they don't take care of their body and they're, and they were like, I'm not getting the vaccine. You know, I'm good. I had COVID once it was fine. They had it really bad the second time. And they're like, I'm getting the vaccine now. I was like, wait a second. I go, hold on. I'm like, you can get it if you want. I'm like, well, why? And they're like, well, cause I almost, I almost died from it. And I was like, it, I hate to say it, but I think you almost died from it because look at what you do to your body, right? Your body wasn't prepared for this. I'm like, if you took those steps, you know what their answer was? Nah, they, they would rather take a shot, take the easy way out right. maybe, um, than, than actually make the harder lifestyle changes because they would rather do that. They derive enough enjoyment from it. So, um, I don't understand it, Ginny. I don't, I don't get it. For me, it was a lack of awareness. It was a lack of truly understanding how bad the standard American diet was. So it was more of an informative thing. Cause I was, I was healthy, right? You were healthy, right? Compared to most, right? So you, right. you thought you were right. And you were, you were doing bridge runs and all this other stuff. So you're like, why would this happen to me? Like I'm the healthy gal. Right. Um, but but so now you take it to a level that to most people almost seems extreme or freakish because it's so out in left field. You're filtering your water. You have an air filter maybe in your house. Like I have I these do. things now. So do I. <laughs> and it's like three grand, right? It was an expensive machine because it was different than the uh, than the air filters out there that are that are hocus pocus. Um, and so it's and when we go out to eat, I'm 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 the most annoying person to go out to eat with. You know, I will only go to certain places, only get certain foods. I need to talk to the chef. Like I'm very particular. Um, and it, 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 it almost, I'm, I'm weird, right? I'm the weird, I'm the weird one. Right. Now. We are the weird ones. Well, I will tell you this after my cancer journey, we celebrated, you know, that I made it and made it well by going on a Viking cruise through Europe. Mm -hmm. And I had to talk to the chef because I was now gluten-free you know, I try not to use dairy as much as possible. And I don't want GMO foods and I don't want glyphosate in my foods because it was found at high levels in my body. Mm -hmm. So I talked to the chef about that. And he said, oh, Mrs. Brandt, you don't understand these countries in Europe you're going through. We don't allow glyphosate in this country. He said, we don't um, harvest our wheat in glyphosate. Our wheat is not going to bother you. And we make all of our breads, you know, fresh and we make them from from uh, scratch and they're not processed. And, and I'm like, why are we so dumb in America? And <laughs> I got on the ship. He takes me back in the kitchen and shows me everything, you know, and how they, how they do things to make me feel more comfortable. And I had no problem eating their bread. I would never eat bread in a restaurant in America because, you know, it would irritate my gut. And yep. so it was just amazing to see that, you know, some places are smarter than we are. We're all into the convenience and having what we want when we want it instead of eating what I call eating food as medicine. But I had no problems on that cruise as long as I chose wisely. They, they gave me enough and they gave me enough healthy food and I was perfectly fine. So, yeah, 
eating out can be a problem, especially in the United States. There's only a few places yes. I will go to, you know. Same. Yeah. In fact, we, we've gotten so clean at our home that we don't like going out. Um, we actually, we, we, we've gone out a few times and you spend a hundred dollars and my wife and I will go out and, and like, you know, have what was supposed to be a nice meal. And you're like, gosh, I can make this better at home. I know it's fresher. I know it's better. And yeah, we only time we really go to eat out is because we travel a lot is in other countries where I know, for example, we were just in Cabo San Lucas and we went to the grocery store and we, we want to get eggs because you were there for several weeks and the eggs were not refrigerated which tells you they're very, very fresh, right? And they're all caged. Mm -hmm. And you can tell when you crack a truly fresh egg, the color of the, of the yolk, the thickness of the way, it doesn't have a lot of water in it. It's, it's thick and it has a different taste to it. And all their, their, their produce was like at a market, it was fresh. Like to find that around here, I got to drive like 20 miles. It's such a, it's, it's crazy. You know, we've gotten to the point where I'm like, we're just going to go move to Bali, just, just farm our own food. So I know that it's like, it's going to be healthy because it's, it's, uh, it's gotten to that point. It's hard to find Jenny. It really is. And you're right. You're, you're a freak, right? You're the, you're the, you're the weird but one. More people like us are popping up and the organic mm -hmm. market is growing. And, you know, as consumers, if we stand up and say, you know, this is what we want and more people stand up and say that, then there'll be more food that is farmed correctly. I mean, I don't, eat anything from a cow or a chicken now that's had, you know, extra hormones added to it for, so they Same. can produce more meat for the cow, more milk for the cow or for more meat for the, for the chicken, because I had an estrogen fed cancer, meaning this growth hormone was out of whack. And so, you know, it's things like that, that I've had to take a good look at and change. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm glad I knew, I know now, I wish I had known sooner, because I don't believe Derek, I would have gotten cancer if I was living back then the way I'm living now. Not that I'm perfect. You know, I believe in the 80, 20 rule. If I do it 80% correct, I do it at home. Correct. When I have to go out because of, I have to meet people for dinner or we're traveling or whatever. I make the best choices I can and I don't worry about it because I don't know exactly what they cook that chicken with. And I'm sure it's not organic chicken. And so, you know, I try to, I always take my smoothie machine with me and I'm always getting those fresh greens and that organic stuff in my smoothie, in my room. I, we did this in uh, Cabo after my mm -hmm. cancer journey, we went there, took our smoothie machine with us and we are sitting there making our smoothie once a day eating out at night and we intermittent fasted up until 12. So, you know, that, that took care of things. So I was making wise choices, but you know, it's, I do believe in the 80, 20 rule because there's no perfect thing in this culture. And I know that we're not going to always eat at home because we do things with other people and we do travel. So, you know, you just got to make the best choice and not, not let it bother you flock your feathers, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know that's, that's great. I, and, and it's taking those extra steps, like bringing your smoothie machine. We did the same thing. Um, we have these acai bowls every morning and all of that stuff. And it, it, it really does. It really does. Like you said, it's that consistency that you did that made such a big difference. Share with us another one of your steps. I don't want to reveal them all. I want people to get your book because there's so much there to unbox, but share another one with us as we sort of kind of go wrap up the, uh, the show here. Okay. Another, another pearl that you think uh, would, would really impact the audience. The value of deep sleep on a consistent basis is definitely one of the steps in my book. The chemotherapy nurse said to me, with what we're going to do to your body, you have got to make sleep a, pri a priority or you're not going to be able to heal from what we're going to do to you. It is during deep sleep that your body heals and repairs. The average American is getting six hours, maybe six and a half hours of sleep when we were designed to get eight to nine. And some people might lay in the bed for eight to nine hours, but they're not in deep sleep. So sleep is a major problem in the United States. A lot of it has to do with Wi-Fi being on at night. We turn that off. The last one that goes to bed turns it off. First one that gets on, you know, gets up, turns it on. Um, but in deep sleep, melatonin, which is a hormone your body makes, 
is a natural immune builder and you ready for this? A cancer fighter. Okay, so if you don't get that deep sleep, your body is not going to heal and repair and regenerate like it's supposed to. And we were created with bodies that were bent towards healing and repairing. And you can see that when you get a cut in a few days, it's going to heal and repair. We couldn't have surgery, go through chemotherapy if our bodies were not created by God to heal and repair on an everyday basis. But sleep is free. You know, water is free. Exercise is free. I'm telling people things that anybody can do if you have enough discipline. But you people cut sleep short thinking, well, I can achieve more in my business if I get five hours sleep rather than eight. Not a very good theory. You see a lot of people um, from my dad working from the, for the president of the United States, the president and his men, it's estimated they age two to three years for every year that they serve because you're on call 24 hours a day. And that red phone that was in our house in McLean, Virginia would ring in the middle of the night. It would be the president of the United States waking my dad up because he had to get him up. He was on call 24 hours a day. That's the way the president is. That's the way his men are. That's the way doctors are. And when you live that way and you can't get that deep, uninterrupted sleep, it, you know, Reagan died from Alzheimer's disease. My father died from Alzheimer's disease, and he was always set on go, and sleep was not a priority. You know, doing what he needed to get done in work and, and in life was a priority. So we have to realize we need to sleep one third of our life, and we need to make it good, deep sleep. Too much happens. It's all free. Too many chemicals that go off, that heal, that do all these things. And we think it's a shortcut we can use when we get in a bind. And I, you know, I watch what I do now. If I take an early morning flight out of Atlanta from here, we'll spend the night at the airport the night before so that we're not missing our deep sleep. And when we caught COVID, we had an emergency that happened in the middle of the night and we lost two nights sleep because of it. Our immune system was down. Mm -hmm. It was easier for us to catch because we didn't get our deep sleep. Okay. So yeah. you don't want that to happen. You want to prevent that from happening as much as possible. So again, a lot of these things don't have to be costly. Some are, but you know, everybody can get deep sleep, hydrate properly. These things are free exercise, eat healthy foods. You might have to eat at home more. Okay. Mm -hmm. But eat healthy foods. Anybody can do that if they choose and they don't have to spend more what people are spending more on today in food is they're eating out so much you eat yes. at home you can stay within budget even with healthy foods yeah and i i you know it's funny when you when you start to go to the grocery store specifically and i want to touch back on the sleep side of things because i think it's very important but you know, the chicken we buy, for example, is, uh, you know, it's free of everything. It's, it's free of all things. And it, it, when I compare that chicken next to the chicken that was shot up with antibiotics and it is half the price, right. And twice as much weight, it's just, it's filled with veins and fat and, and weird looking things, striations in it, that the chicken we buy is so, I mean, you can cut it with a, with like a spoon, right. It is so pure it is more expensive right so i've had the argument that it is more expensive and i said okay well listen it's more expensive for a reason it's harder to to do it the right way but okay would you rather spend a little bit more on your chicken now or have lost wages and healthcare bills from the fact that you ate cheaper chicken and cheaper things down the road that are going to afford you cancer and other health related issues so uh, you know for me i'd rather preventatively spend it on the front end Right. Right. And versus, but either way, you're going to pay. Right. Either you're, way, you're, you're going to pay. pay. And I paid dearly. I was I was technically almost a million dollar cancer patient. So you can only imagine what that cost when the insurance company sent someone from Dallas, Texas, to fly to my home to meet me and be my guide during the cancer journey. I, I have to give them credit for the for the effort. When I met her, you, know, you have to have a sense of humor. When I met her at the door after my second surgery, I said, did you bring a gun? And she said, why would I bring a gun? And I said, well, I was just figuring up, figuring up what I'm going to cost me and especially 
more importantly, my insurance company, and it's going to be close to a million dollars. So I just figured I was worth more dead than alive. (laughs) She got so tickled. She said, okay, I get your sense of humor. She said, look, a sense of humor is good during the cancer journey. It promotes healing. And I was, I was joking with her, but the point is, yes, you pay on the front end by doing the right things Mm -hmm. because you do not want to pay on the back end for what we forked out for our part of those co-pays was oh, yeah. ooh, horrible. So something to think I, about. A hundred percent. Yep. So people, people need to, um, and, and when you, when it relates to, 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 to your fitness, a lot of people, I think I, I hear the comment and I've heard it for years. I don't have the time for it. Right. And it's like, no, you do. It's just not a priority. And it's like, you either make time for fitness or you're going to make time for sickness. Again, either way, you're going to pay, right? That's right. And the same with sleep, right? So, you know, uh, uh, in today's society, especially in the entrepreneurial space, so it's all about hustle. It's all about grind it out. It's all about, and, and I, was, I, was a, I was part of that. I believed in it. I subscribed to it. And I was like, I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? Um, well, what I didn't realize was the harm it was causing my body over time. And yeah, I got sick more and I had, I had more issues that came from not sleeping. So again, I, I paid for it in my time later in loss of production and all those things. And sleep's a beautiful thing. Do you use any type of um, sleep monitoring device so you can kind of keep an eye on certain metrics? Um, do, do you use anything right now? Uh, I've heard about an that? O-ring, but I have not used it. It does sound interesting. It might be something I will invest in just for, for curiosity's sake, but yeah. And I use a, some natural things. During the cancer journey, all the chemotherapy keeps you wide awake because they have to give you steroids to be able to handle it. Mm-hmm. And so you're like, whoa, how am I going to sleep? So I used natural essential oils like lavender that help you sleep. And again, you've got to turn off the Wi-Fi. People don't realize this. When Wi-Fi is going off, it tricks your eye into thinking that the light is on. And it can keep you out of deep sleep and keep you from producing melatonin. So really, all this Wi-Fi is not great for us. And I don't believe in holding cell phones near you. But it is a part of our culture. You can at least turn it off at night when your body needs to completely rest for it. And I've had surgeons tell me that because of all the Wi-Fi and all the electromagnetic fields in the surgery rooms that they work in, they go home at night and the room is pitch black dark and they have a kill switch in their bedroom where every outlet is off. So there is no disturbance to their body from any magnetic or electromagnetic field. Huh. I've heard of these scram. That's, that's, that's interesting. That is, I've heard of a kill switch is a great idea. I've also heard of these scramblers that you can, it's like a, you can flick a switch and it'll, it'll block any EMF from coming in around. It's it uh, from the scrambler. I I heard on Ben Greenfield's show, I, I didn't look into it, but um, I, I have not gotten in the habit of doing that. Um, and, but I'm going to, after having you say it, because it's like, you are the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of had enough people tell me about EMF, uh, that, that I, I think it's something I'm willing to try. One thing that, that worked for me, and I don't know if you had experience with this, with sleeping that changed my life. Cause I wasn't a good sleeper was doing what's called box breathing, um, which is a form of, it's a breathing technique I would do for 10 minutes before I'd go to bed while I was just sitting down, just reading a book or watching Netflix with my wife or just hanging out. Um, and it's, it, it's a box breathing. It, you, are you familiar with box breathing? Yes. Yeah. So, so, but that technique to sort of flick that parasympathetic sympathetic right. switch from go, go, go all day. I've since having done that and f- discovered that and I have something that monitors my sleep statistics. My heart rate dropped. My HRV went through the roof, which is a good thing. My breathe rate, my breath rate dropped. And I, I attribute a lot of it to, uh, to the breathing, almost all of it. And I'm going to now flick off the Wi-Fi and I will follow up with you and let you know if I see any difference in my sleep as well, because I, I sleep is... Sleep is precious. We actually don't use an alarm clock in our home. We go to bed uh, and we allow ourselves to wake up when our body wants to wake up as well, you know, because you don't want to interrupt that deep sleep. So I'm glad to hear you value sleep. And it's, again, it's a free thing. Like you said, it's totally free. Water's free, exercise free, air's free. Um, Just, uh, 
I, I think, I, I think we joked about uh, the, the length of podcasts and shows that you're recently on. We could probably talk here for hours. So, <laughs> we could. so with that, with that yeah. said, I, I have two last questions for you. Um, so I'll fire with the first one. So the first question is, okay, how can people get in contact with you? People that want to either prevent cancer because it exists in their family or they have concerns, or maybe they're currently experiencing it. How, how do we get in contact with Jenny? They can go to my website at www.jennyginnybrantbrant.com. I have a contact page. I also have a cancer prevention and wellness blog they can sign up for, and they'll get the weekly. I just posted this morning. They'll they'll get the weekly uh, post. So that's a great thing to do. Information about my book is on there, but they can on that contact, it will send me an, an email and I do answer those emails. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and also in the show notes for this show, for those who are listening, we will put all of Ginny's contact information to get in contact with her. All right. So last question, I asked the same question of everybody at the end of the show. We talked about a lot of things uh, and there's also a lot of things that we just didn't get an opportunity to get to. So if someone was listening to the show and they forgot everything that you just said, but they only remembered and, and walked away with us with one, one thing that they can implement into their life, whether you said it or you didn't get an opportunity to say it, that would help them change the way they're living their life to be the best version of themselves, mentally, physically, emotionally, all of that from your world, from your universe and what you do, what would that, that one thing be that they could take with them as a nugget for today? Realize that we have an, a miraculous self-healing body. And we need to be a part of our own cure. Do not expect the doctor to do everything. They have tools in their box. I probably am here today because of the tools in the doctor's box. I'm never going to negate that. Conventional medicine has saved my life several times. But don't expect the doctor to do everything. It's not the doctor's responsibility. It's your responsibility first. I love it. It's such a profound message. I, I, I can't stress enough for those who have had the opportunity to listen to this, to check out Jenny's website. I know, check out her book, sign up for her blog, because the message that you're delivering is one that everyone needs to hear, which is getting back to those basics, those fundamentals, what seems logical, but isn't. Um, <laughs> you may think you're healthy, but it, you probably aren't. Um, and really understanding and investing in the knowledge today so that you can live not only a long lifespan that everyone talks about, right, but uh, really a long health span, right? Because there's people that live the last 20 years of their life and they're, they're just, they're immobile, they're decrepit, they're diseased, they have Alzheimer's, whatever, the, whatever they're stricken with. You know, that's not cool. Um, sure, you lived a while, but you're a vegetable. It's a lot nicer if you can have a health, um, a long health span. And that, and that what you're talking about, um, Ginny, is, is what can make that impact on people. So please keep doing what you're doing. Keep being that voice. Um, and, and I would love to have you on again to dive even deeper. Sounds great. Just let me know. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ginny. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Adapt You Podcast. We hope that today's show gave you the inspiration, tools, and resources, and just motivation to become and improve and change yourself on your path and on your journey to becoming the absolute best version of yourself. Now that said, today's episode is brought to you by Adapt Media Agency, a full service digital marketing agency based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, servicing customers across the globe. So whether you're a small startup business or a large business looking for digital marketing needs, Adapt Media Agency is there to help you with things such as website development, videography, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube advertising, social media management, search engine optimization, pay-per-click advertising, I go on and on and on, but anything digitally marketing related that is going to help you grow your brand and change the way that you're interacting with your companies, Adapt Media Agency is that company for you. So if you wanna learn more information, you can see our links in the mentions below or go to www.adaptmediaagency.com 
www.thinkandgrowthacademy.com for more information. So thanks again for listening to the show. We hope you had an amazing experience. If you like this show and you felt it uh, did a great job for you, if you're listening to us uh, you know, over, the, over iTunes or one of the podcast channels, please leave us a review. It really helps us grow our brand and grow uh, the show to deliver you greater guests and greater content. And if you're watching on YouTube, please pound that like button, hit the subscribe, and uh, so that way you don't miss uh, another episode here of the Adapt2 Podcast. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.